Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight, political commentator and talk show host Bill Press will be here to discuss a range of issues involving President Obama, his jobs proposal, the GOP reaction to it, and the president at the UN yesterday. But first, I want to welcome to the show Dean Obadullah. Um, Aaron Cater, who's stuck in traffic, is going to be here shortly, but Dean and Aaron are uh, together in a comedy program here tonight. Dean is co-creator and co-producer of the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. He's executive director of the Amman Stand-Up Comedy uh, Festival as well. And I want to thank you for joining us again. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming back. back. On. I appreciate it. Um, you have <coughs> just done a rather extraordinary tour. Went down south. Murfreesboro was one of the places you went, the place where the mosque was uh, challenged in mm -hmm. court because Islam's not a religion, it's a cult. And... Um, uh, you went right to them with a show called The Muslims Are Coming. Um, I want to ask if we can uh, a, a little about, well, let's show a clip from that if we could. Um, let's show a little clip from that. But uh, while they're, they're, they're setting that up, uh, okay, they're, they're ready with it. Let's do that right now. Let's look at a clip that CNN did on the, the Murphy's Bill program. Al-Qaeda claims responsibility for things they could have never done. They call up, okay, do you know the eclipse? We did it for Allah. We're keeping the sun. It is ours now, my friend. We're here doing a comedy tour called The Muslims Are Coming, and it's all free shows across the South. Uh, we started out in Gainesville, Florida, where Terry Jones, the Quran burner, is based. We're making our way up to Columbus, Georgia. Now we're in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, in Gwinnett County. Tomorrow we're off to Birmingham, Alabama, then Tupelo, Mississippi, then Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and finally ending up in Nashville, Tennessee. It's going to become a film, um, and it's it's to sort of introduce people around the country who have never met a Muslim um, to some Muslims. I, I've been really uh, mesmerized by the stuff that's been going on in the Middle East. It started a few months back. It's still going. The, the rolling revolutions, the Facebook and Twitter revolutions, right, that started in Egypt and went on to Yemen and Bahrain and Syria and Libya. And oh my God, I didn't realize there were so many countries in the Middle East. You know? I thought it was just one big brown violent blob. <laughs> I didn't, next thing you know, they're, they're going to say there's different cultures and languages, which is just, shut up, that's crazy. Um. I mean, the, the funny thing about Islamophobia are the, the kernels of untruth, and they're so untrue that they are funny to me. <laughs> is it true if a group of women get naked that Muslim men must kill themselves? <laughs> it was on the web, uh, on the internet. I read about the Loch Ness Monster on the internet. You cannot believe everything you read. The biggest reason why I'm here on this tour is because the America that I'm hearing on TV is not the America that I grew up in. And it, I find it really sickening that it's become like, anti-Muslim has become a platform that you can get elected on. And I felt like it was important to come down here and be like, look, Muslims aren't an other. We don't have to go back to our country. I'm from New Jersey. That is my country. You know what I mean? Looks like a sellout crowd. Well, the show's for free. Yeah. So when you do shows for free, uh, it tends to attract people. And the reason the shows are for free, it really is a passion project. And my friend Nagin Farsad and myself started this. We raised money from friends, from family, from people we barely knew to give us money to go out and reach out to people. It's really, the tour is really American to American. We happen to be Muslim, but we're Americans reaching out to our fellow Americans, trying to use comedy to break down these ridiculous stereotypes and misconceptions people have. And I think we have to go out there and meet people. It's like a campaign. We have to go out, meet them where they live, shake their hands, talk to them, answer their questions. The, st the press releases from Muslim groups in America are well-intentioned. They're not making a difference. We have to go out and meet people and engage them where they live, in the Deep South. The next, we're going to Utah and Arizona and Idaho and Kansas and Missouri, and we're going to meet as much as the funding we can get, because we're filming it for a documentary, as many states as we'll go to, as much as we can fund it. We want to get out there. Tell me, though, when you, was there something singular that prompted this idea or something you've been thinking about for a while? I think, I think it goes back to really the Ground Zero Mosque, as people call it, uh, to see the unveiling of this anti-Muslim rhetoric that I had never seen before. And I hate to use the term Islamophobia. It's Muslim hate. It's a hate group. The leaders of the Muslim hate movement are listed on the Center for Poverty, uh, SPLC, Center for Southern Poverty Law Center, in the same league as the Klan, Aryan Terror Brigade, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the neo-Nazis, that's where they play, that's where Pamela Gell and Robert Spencer, that's where they are now, and that's where they should go, and we have to push them to the margin. We have to
have to make sure people realize these voices of hate are on the extreme right. People we met, we did so many things during the day. We did Ask a Muslim, set up a booth. We played a game called Name That Religion. We didn't tell people who our background. We read quotes from the New Testament, Old Testament, the Quran. So people can guess it. And it was interesting to people to get it wrong. And, and a lot of people had issues about Muslims, but not personal, not saying a Muslim did this to me. More, I heard people say this to what me. What do you I, account for the explosion of hate that occurred? I mean, after 9-11, there was this initial flurry of hate crimes. Then right. there was a lull. Yes. Then it started up again with a vengeance just a couple years ago. You know, I think it was latent and beneath the surface, and we didn't know that because I felt the same way, that we were in this post-9-11 post world, where in 2006, 2007, yeah. things had come. When President Obama was running for election, then got elected, and you saw polls saying 25% of Republicans thought he was a Muslim, it occurred to me that they hate Muslims so much that President Obama can't be one of them. So they had problem, fundamental issues with Muslims that I was not aware of. I thought, since they had stopped asking us questions, I thought they were happy with us. They stopped asking questions because they were fed the wrong answers by people on the far right. And it's the extreme right, frankly. It's not mainstream Republicans. It's the extreme right that's further than When you did these shows, mm -hmm. um, were the audience... Uh, the same old, same old, no. just transplanted New Yorkers living down south? Or did you actually reach people you feel that were the folks you needed to be talking to? For all the shows, I'll tell you, the audience were 5 to 10% Muslim or Arab. It was the most non-Arab, non-Muslim audience we've ever played. Did they laugh? They laughed a great deal. Did you alter, did you have to alter the humor? Well, you, did you make fun of them, or did you make fun of yourself? We made fun of both. both. That's what okay. you do. As a comedian, you make fun of ourselves, and it gives, opens up to make fun of culture down there and joke around about the South, and you know, everywhere you go, it's, it's a gun shop, a waffle house, a church, and repeat. You know, that's what it's down when you're traveling to the yeah. South. But they, you know, a lot of people, like we were in Gainesville where Terry Jones, the Quran burner's base. The people came out there to tell us, Terry Jones does not represent us. And I believed that before I went, and I'm so happy to hear that, that these people are on the far right, and the media makes it seem like Gainesville is a hotbed for anti-Muslim sentiment. Not at all. The, the mayor is openly gay. It's a progressive city, yet painted in the same color Muslims are painted with the worst examples. So, you know, it was great to meet people down south. It was great to answer. We had some tough questions. We told people, ask me the Q&A at the end of every show. We met people on the street who said, what are the rumors? What have you heard? You don't have to say you believe in it. And we'd hear some go, well, I heard there's a training camp of Muslims in Dearborn. And you say, where did you hear this from? They go, well, we don't know this. We just hear this from these people. And you start to talk to them and said, well, don't you think the government, if they I knew about it? I remember after 9-11, the story, uh, Howard Stern, I think, started it about how people were dancing on the rooftops in Patterson, New Jersey. Right. Um, obviously, he had morphed a story that had been broadcast from Gaza to Patterson, and then it went to Dearborn. And before I knew it, I was hearing about people on rooftops in city, cities across the country. Never happened. A researcher at Rutgers had gone into it, looked, looked it up, found no evidence of that at all. But you're right. I mean, these stories, once they start, take on a life of their They're own. They're a phantom menace. They're the hardest to find. We're going to take I'll a break right now because sure. uh, uh, Aaron is here. Uh, got through traffic, and uh, we'll be right back. Just be back after a quick break. We are back, and we are joined now by Aaron Cater. He's a founding member of the Axis of Evil Comedy Tour, the regular at the Comedy Store in Hollywood, California, and recently became the first person to formally teach stand-up comedy in the Middle East. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Traffic was bad? Yeah, it's rush hour, I guess, huh? Yeah. Isn't D.C. rated one of the highest, worst traffic places I, in America? I, I don't know, but I just came from New York where the U.N. General Assembly is taking you place. Went? That is gridlock. It is gross. Dean lives right around there. Yeah. Well, I'm glad Aaron's here. Was I was very awful. happy. Let me talk. We were talking about the tour down there, and I was asking him before we broke whether or not the, the shows attracted the same old, same old, or a new crowd. And he was telling me that it was a lot of new people. I was wondering, did the comedy then have to adapt itself? Uh, or do you do the same show, or did you work new material into it? Uh, you know, we always try to work new material into uh, every show we do, but it is nice to see a new audience, and it does give us the opportunity to repeat uh, maybe jokes. But it, it, as a comic, I think there's a challenge to say, every time you do a show, Pretend like they've never seen you before so you can put on your best Did show. Did they get the jokes? Yeah. The Arab ones? Yeah. And they laughed? Always. And uh, uh, it's, it's always a new opportunity with the new audience. And even if it's the same old, you still have to perform as if they've never seen you. Give them a good show. I think that's just part of a kind of a show when, business. When I was thing. asking you about, did you, I, I mean, we've heard the jokes, the, the storyline you use when you're talking to audiences in the north, east, mm -hmm. and on the west coast the Arabs are the new black, whatever, and, and that kind of stuff. And I know how that works. 
give me an example of something you would use down there with that crowd that you were talking to, trying to reach them in a new way about Arabs and Muslims that, that didn't have either an experience, direct experience, or had some, you know, mostly the, the airways filled with negative stuff. Give me something that you used to sure. sort of it, make the point. I did a joke in the entire South teaching what the word inshallah meant. And that inshallah, it, that means God willing or in the will of God, but in the Middle East it's used for anything happening in the future. Like I said, overuse. Like I was at a restaurant in Jordan and I asked the waiter, where's the bathroom? He goes, it's over there. I go, but I said, I'll be right back. He goes, inshallah. I'm like, what has happened in your bathroom that I need God to protect me? <laughs> and the, the audience there were almost 90% non-Muslim, laughed, and I would do it as a callback through the act. I would say something about inshallah here or inshallah that, and they would laugh. And I even joked, I said, I'm not trying to impose Sharia law. I'm just trying to teach you a new <laughs> word in Arabic so you don't have to be afraid anymore. It's in the will of God. And they got it. And after the show, we get emails from white people going, inshallah, <laughs> inshallah. You know? um, people are much more open-minded. They want to hear us. They want to hear our story. They're tired of being told things about us by the Fox News and the people on the extreme right. I'll be mm -hmm. honest with you. They, want to, they said to us, we're so glad you're here. We're finally glad to ask these questions because no one's been down here to answer these questions. Did you get into them telling <laughs> jokes about them, about culture in the South? Uh, uh, you mean us telling jokes yeah. about like redneck jokes yeah. or something like that? Yeah, well, you know, I grew up here in Virginia, and I do a joke about, you know, growing up around rednecks and this and that, and I do feel sort of like connected to them the way you would with Italians in New York, and it's like, it's it does bridge that gap where it's like, hey, we get you, so you you should understand us because we've taken that step to understand you. I've done a joke before. It depends on the sophistication of the crowd. Where my grandfather immigrated because the Ottoman Empire was sort of crumbling in Jerusalem. So he comes in 1912, and then later on they force him to join the army and draft him, and he has to go back to fight World War I and fight the Ottomans. So he leaves, and then they send him back to, it's the same, you know. And sometimes a crowd will get that joke, regardless of their ethnic background, because it's more historical, it's more of a global, and I think that that helps connect all of us. Um, and so when we write jokes for white people, we still want to infuse some sort of global sort of you know mm -hmm. outlook on on who we are as Arabs and how Arabs have contributed to the world. If you want to get in the conversation give us a call the numbers are going to be up on the screen if you're calling from overseas the number is 001-202-420-5665 if you're calling from here in the U.S. it's 1202-420-5730 give me an example of something that happened down there made you think to yourself this is working I, it was more man on the street stuff, talking to people yeah. during the day. When you did the Ask an Arab thing? Well, we did, we, there we did Ask a Muslim, we did uh -huh. Name That Religion. We even did things where we didn't tell people what our background was and asked them, said we're doing a documentary on a religion, and we would ask them questions, and a lot of them were very forthcoming in, in their views. The, I was very happy we didn't hear any horribly racist things. We heard people ask questions. We had a discussion well, with some... That one question about the women... Exactly. Well, women, we were with Maysoon and Nagin, and they dressed very cosmopolitan. And so many people would say to them, how come you could dress like this if you're a Muslim? They really only <laughs> knew Muslims yeah. dressed in TV shows and in movies in the news, either in a burqa or at least a hijab, but actually as a burqa. They thought they'd be completely covered up with an aqab and everything. And Maysoon and Nagin were very, it was great explained. And it was the first time many of them had ever met a Muslim in their life. So. Many of them said, I don't agree with everything you guys talk about or your religion, but you coming down here meant something. And that, you know, most Polish... How did the local Muslim community deal with it? In the South? Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't do these shows in the South, but I have gone to do shows in the South. Okay. Um, but uh, the Muslim community, it depends on the Muslim community. If they're like, um, <coughs> you know, I've done shows for the Council of American Islamic Relations and CARE, and they happen to be more East Indian Muslim, you know, Pakistanis, and... Culturally, they're different. Um, I was just in Houston and uh, uh, doing shows for mostly a Muslim Pakistani crowd. And, and that was a little bit of an adjustment, but, uh, but they also know the culture down there. So you can make fun of that and then make fun of the Islamic culture and, 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 and Arabs. And I think there's always a way, but it is a challenge. I, I think there's always a, it's always tough to sort of get people on board with you that maybe have never been exposed to it. And that's the goal. Find people that have never really been exposed to assimilated Arab Americans and get them on board with our sense of humor. Let me go to New York for a phone call. Caller? Hello? Yes, am I on? Yeah, you are. Your question. Yes, thank you. My name is Iyad. I'm calling from New York and I had a question for Dino Vidala. Yeah. Yeah, uh, his show starts not in the post-9-11 era, 
and at a time when the U.S. invaded Iraq and America's standing in the Arab world was uh, pretty much low. And I know there was an effort on behalf of the U.S. government to improve America's image in the Arab world. And I wanted to know if Dean Obeidallah feels that he was used by the U.S. government because he's sponsored by the State Department. Thank you. I'm not sponsored by the State Department. I don't... Uh, I'm are not, you sponsored by? Who are I, you? I, I would, I'd love to be f sponsored by somebody. I'm not sponsored by anyone, but uh, every show I've done in the Middle East has been through private uh, organizations, either the Amman the Set Up Comedy Festival or shows around there. I've been to uh, State Department uh, events here in the States. Uh, I'm proud to, to do whatever I can to try to build bridges, but it's always been through uh, private sectors, never through the public, never through the government. Would sending you? me anywhere. I remember you guys lamenting the demise of George W. Bush and Obama wasn't going to be as funny. Does Rick Perry give you new hope? That's true. Him and Mitt Romney, because, you know, my mom comes from Utah and uh, my dad is, well, the Mormons are going to give me a chance to go to that well. But, uh, yeah, Rick Perry and, uh, and a lot of these, anytime it's political season, anytime there's election, it's definitely uh, fuels the fire for comedy. Uh, and Obama is a little bit more of a challenge because he's probably quietly, in, 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 in private, my, my take on him is he's probably a lot more boring than we think. He's probably got an iron butt, he can just sit there and talk. Who, Perry? No, uh, Obama, he's oh. a little bit more <coughs> difficult to get an angle on sometimes. But politically, there's always an issue that's easy to mm -hmm. pick on, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, that's, that's what I think Dean and I probably both try to do. You guys did so much stuff with George Bush. Yeah. I think, as a comedian, you look around, I, I thought Sarah Palin had the, the greatest potential. I think Perry, of uh, you know, between you can him just and Bush, resurrect all your old stuff. You can, in yeah. a way, but I, th I mean, it would be <laughs> odd when you think about Bush as being the smarter of the last two governors of Texas. I mean, that's kind of, and as a comedian, you're like this guy's got. But I think one thing Perry's better. He's got better hair. I got to give him he that. He has better. great hair. Who said that he's like George Bush on steroids? Is that just I don't been know. out there? I think that's. Let me go to Colorado for a call. Caller, hello. And I went out and bought a scarf and was trying to wear it uh, the 1st of September to show that I, no way, believe Muslims did the 9-11. Yeah. And also, you know, I wanted people to get used to it. Because I, I think it's the same old thing. If you want a war, you target a, a group of people. You want a war mm -hmm. against the Indians, you say they're savages. And, uh, so what I, reaction did you get, Susan? Very mixed. But mostly, when I explained it, people just don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I tell them about Shaker Amer, the last person, the last uh, UK resident in Guantanamo, and they say, oh, they know there was torture in Guantanamo, but they don't know any of the details. Yeah. So I think this is great. My, uh, my husband's very, he, he's got a great sense of humor, and he gets kind of tired of my heaviness. Let, let, so let it's me. it's really good to ask him. Let me let me let me stop you there. I just want to ask I want to ask these guys a question about this. Um, the women you have mm -hmm. are a admittedly very progressive. Yes. Um, I think moderate. Maysoon's moderate, but Nagin's very progressive. But there is an entire grouping of American Muslims who are more conservative. Sure. Sure. Does 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 what you do do justice to them? Does it help people understand? Do they say, oh, you're the funny guys, you're the good guys, but, but we got these other ones here who are mm. a problem. Do, do, it, does that ever become an issue? It, not to me. About? I mean, to the, what we're doing is our, our tour, the Muslims are coming, and every show we've done, we only speak for ourselves. I don't pretend, I don't try to speak for the Muslim community, for the Arab American community. That's why we don't take funding from any organizations. With the American tour, not even from Muslim American organizations, we said no to any funding. We're just going out and telling our story. On some level, we, we definitely represent certain Arabs in America, and America, certain Muslims in America, but not all. Uh, but thankfully, I'll say almost overwhelmingly, the community in America has been supportive of us in our efforts. I think we're all coming from it from different angles. If we were the only ones doing something, I'd be worried. But there's comedians, there's other artists, there's academics doing it, people in government, within our government, trying to make a difference who are Arab and Muslim. Uh, I've never seen more Muslims in, a, in an administration than I've seen in the Obama administration. Uh, so, I mean, that's a testament to Including some would say the president. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps the president. Yeah. Let's, go to Let's go to California for a call. Caller? Hello? Hello? Yes, hi. Your question? Yes. Yeah, I'm just, uh, this is in connection to what you just said. Uh, when I was in Morocco with my girl, 
I mean, uh, the women, over 25% are in the workforce. And another thing, too, is everybody is dressed modern, not everybody, but the majority. And my daughter has never seen topless beaches, and they were there. A beach with girls uh, basically naked and mini skirts. And it's very modern. And we went out, and my daughter seen seeing girls sitting drinking beer, and they go, Mom, Mom, look at that. I mean, he's right. A lot of people in America are ignorant to the fact that Islam is not what they think Islam is all about. There's a lot of freedom. You see few people covered here, and they think that's the world. Okay. We're going to a core, a core of a Muslim country. I mean, we are in the Muslim country. And it's very liberal. We Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the call. Comment on that? Well, I would just, just to, on the same, on your original question was, there's two couple of different ways to go about it, and I think as as comics, you know, we could see it as a burden that there are, a, 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 there's a diverse group of Muslims that are that very different. You know, there's there's Sunni and Shiites and and, and Sushis. You know what I mean? There's there's mix. You, you can mix. You can't address all of them. You could see that as a burden because how do you address all of them, and make them all happy? But we don't approach it like that. We see ourselves as. Uh, the, that generation, that next generation, that we came from Muslim or Arab heritage, and uh, we're Americans first, and the, and people get on board with that or they don't, and you, you can't change people, you can't force anybody to change their views. You just want to, um, you, like we've been saying, you write your jokes for Americans, for white people. If they can get on board and we can touch them, that's actually more important to us. So we don't burden ourselves with trying to appeal to all Muslims or, right. or all Arabs. We are trying to appeal to the others that are totally ignorant or somewhat ignorant to the culture over there. They've never been over there. And I've told Christians, and I'm sure Dean would agree with this, when you go to the South and you might meet some real Bible-thumping, you know, Baptist Christians, I've always said, go to Jerusalem. You know, it's a real place. It's not just in the Bible. It's not just a fantasy place. It's a real place. Go visit it. Because I feel that if a lot of real Christians, real Christians, went over there and saw what kind of a police state they were running in Jerusalem, they might wake up to the, some of the realities politically, and, and maybe they would, they would open up their minds to that conflict as well. Let me go to Wisconsin for a call. Caller? Hello? Uh, yes. Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed uh, saving uh, your Axis of uh, Evil comedy tour. Aaron, anyway, was on there. And I'm so enjoying this conversation, but I, I chose that to celebrate the uh, ominous occasion that everyone needs to investigate a little further with uh, Infowars.com and support Ron Paul and really look into what's behind what's going on in our civilization worldwide. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that's a good. I mean, that's true. You you should not accept words without uh, investigation. Uh, when you blind acceptance, I think leads to to a scary result. You can be led easily. Let me go to Nevada for a call, caller. Hello. Hello. Yeah, your question. I want to con. Yes, I want to congratulate you and uh, uh, a belated Eid Mubarak. And uh, there is a show. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you. Ask your question, oh, okay. please. Uh, there's a program where people, uh, there's Anthony Bourdain goes to different countries, and he was in uh, Saudi Arabia. And the sense of humor, you were saying, the Dania, the young lady that was showing him around, they went scuba diving off from Jeddah. And Anthony made the joke that she even has an aqua abaya. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I saw that. we do need comedy and stuff. Uh, my wife, uh, she is from uh, Kashmir. Yeah. And uh, my doctor, uh, she is from Lahore. I told my doctor one day, I go, I would love to visit Lahore. What a beautiful city. And she goes, if you want to visit someplace, she goes, go to Turkey. I'm not quite sure I got that one, but... but Turkey's a beautiful But uh, comedy, the comedy. Yeah. You guys... Let me, just, let me stop Let me stop you there. Appreciate and, that. Eat Mubarak to you as well. <laughs> let, me, let me stop you there and, and, uh, and, and ask you guys. The, you, you've been now... Um, to the Arab world, number of times in mm -hmm. a number of locations. Mm -hmm. You were teaching stand-up comedy. You organized the the the, the stand-up uh, program in in, sure. in Amman, uh, and and you've been here. Does it require an alteration of the persona of who you are as you go from place to place? 
No, but as a comedian, you adjust to the audience you're in front of, wherever you are. A show in New York City is different than one in New Jersey. I'm talking about a 10 minute drive. You've changed the type of audience, the type of dynamic, who's there, how diverse it is. New York City, a little bit more cosmopolitan, very diverse crowd. Jersey, so obviously in the Middle East, you're going to tweak your act a little bit to appeal to the people in that audience. But 90% of the jokes I do here, I do there, vice versa. The young people through the internet and YouTube have really become connected. It's really a great. Uh, you denominator that of, of a you know a base that we can all relate to. They can look up up any time and learn about America through YouTube. They can learn unfiltered. Yeah. You can learn about I mean, all of everything. This might be repetitive to you because we've talked before, but it is a sense of pride for me that I c the jokes that I wrote in Los Angeles for I think before I went to the Middle East about seven or eight years. We took to the Middle East and I did the same jokes and I got the same reaction and it was like, how great is that 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 you know. The, we could write jokes that were so universally accepted that you could literally go to any place on earth and feel that, that they would be received the s same way in Los Angeles as they would be in, in Cairo, you know, and, and, and they were. The last caller was speaking about comedy in the, in the region. It, it is interesting. I've had uh, uh, Ahmed on about, about Egypt, obviously a very funny place. Mm -hmm. uh, people mm -hmm. don't get the fact that, that Arabs are funny. You're yeah. very funny. And love that. humor. Yeah. And there's some boring ones. Yeah. But there are some funny ones too. You taught stand-up comedy. What what are the what do you do? How do you how do you do that? I mean, people either are funny or not funny. Well, that's true. You can teach somebody the structure. You can teach somebody how to think in those terms. At the end of the day, Dean and I know this. We all write jokes and overwrite. But when you get on stage, you kind of got to let it rip and be yourself and and have conviction in 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 yourself. Uh, so I knew a, a person who taught stand-up, and he gave me sort of some parameters, some outline, and, and I would get them thinking, give them some, some sort of a writing assignment, one of them which is like, just think of a negative opinion. Don't you hate it when your socks are dirty, you step in a puddle, blah, blah, blah. And how do you express that? How you grew up, how your mom is, and you get to this universal place where we all had moms, we all you know, got in trouble as kids, we all had these experiences, and it, it, it either comes out, you're a funny person and you know how to express it, or, or you can't. But, and it was a challenge, but I was proud because Dean organized the festival and allowed for a certain amount of people to audition to get in. And they accepted six people. Four of them were from my class. So even if they weren't funny, they were prepared and they had written and structured their, their act. So there is a structure to comedy in, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and developing your point of view is, is all you really need. But at the end of the day, you're right. You're either funny or... or Let me go to Ohio. Caller? Uh, uh, yeah, my name's Doug Stanford. Yeah, your yeah. question? Um, I was just curious if any of their jokes have offended anybody from their own country. That's we a good offend, one. I offend people all the time. I yeah. offend people left and right. Yeah. But in America, but I don't really care. And that if it's a political joke, it's a joke about American politics, it's something about like the Bush administration, and I was talking about the Patriot Act, and I despised it and talked about it. I didn't care if you were offended. I'm a comedian, and I'm a political and social comedian. I don't try to be offensive to those who are outside of power. Those in power, I have no problem mocking. I'm not going to make fun of homeless people. I'm not going to make fun of people with mental challenges or, or physical disabilities. But, you know, uh, the comedy has to have an edge. Uh, if it doesn't, then you're not a political comic. You're just a comic talking about family and, and farting and stuff like that. That's not the kind of comedy I ever want to do. You have a great routine about <coughs> your uh, relative in Jordan. Yeah. Uh, hate in America. Yeah. You want to just do that? Cause that yeah, well, he, he likes to talk politics and he, and he uh, America, we are so, they are so, they think they're big and strong like they own everything, you know? It's not true. Uh, you hungry? You want some Burger King or McDonald's or uh, Starbucks, you know? And <laughs> which hotel you are? Uh, Sheraton, Hilton, or Marriott? Yeah. Back to America. They think they own everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't know how funny he is, yeah. but you know, Faya's my my cousin. I did point out how he, he his contradiction, and and then he starts laughing at himself. Yeah. Oh, I did that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want royalties for this joke. <laughs> you know, so they always can laugh, and that's the biggest surprise of all. I think over the years, how Arabs have a sense of humor about themselves. It's not self being self-deprecating is not a very Muslim or Arab uh, trait. Um, and you know, in the we, media, uh, in, in real life, it is. But in the yeah. in American media, we don't see that yeah. side to Arab. Let me go to let me go to Saudi Arabia for a call, caller. Oh, Saudi. Oh. Okay. Hi. Your question. Uh, what's your opinion uh, about? Hello. Yes. yes. 
uh, I want to just know, first of all, Eid Mubarak. And I just want to know your opinion uh, about when the people make jokes about uh, some people we believe as the sender, Rasul Muhammad or uh, other people we believed in our uh, history and our religion. What's your opinion? Are you uh, agree with these people who make jokes? Or not. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, are, are, are the, well, the question, are there red lines? Uh, right. People who make jokes about the prophet or people who make jokes about things that, that, that are, are sensitive to the faith? I think I, I, I won't tell the joke because I don't want to risk getting in trouble with this, but during Ramadan is the easiest time to offend people because people are hungry and they're ornery. So that's, that's the best time to really offend <laughs> yeah. people. You know, don't, and you don't. You don't say anything about the prophet or the Quran or... Or there, there are red lines, and, and we know this as, as you know, having Muslim family, and you just got to stay away from those things. But um, you know, in place of that, you might say the Bible, or you might say the Old Testament, or the Talmud, or or say something. But but not to you know get behind the curtain here, but you just don't say anything about the Prophet or, or the Holy Quran. You just can't because it's just. I'm not going to do. I wouldn't do jokes demonizing any religion. That's just my own choice. I wouldn't make. You're there, to, you're there to educate people about right. Islam, not, yeah. not make not, people. And, and the same thing, I wouldn't demonize Christians or Jews, frankly. I mean, yeah. it's not yeah. part of who I am as a comedian. My comedy is about trying to bring people together, not divide us by religion. We're already divided enough. Yeah. We're polarized as can be in America. Uh, and in the Middle East, I'll tell you that, you know, Aaron talked about teaching people. The big story is the young people there doing stand-up now. No longer us going there. Yeah. It's Saudi Arabia has a vibrant stand-up comedy. They're scene. incredibly talented. Jordan, there. Egypt, yeah. uh, Muscat, Doha, where I've done shows. The young people, they're all doing, men and women are doing comedy. They learn by watching it on YouTube. They taught themselves. Sometimes we've taught workshops there. So to me, I'm much more excited about the growth organically of stand-up comedy there by the Arabs. No longer being an import. An import you from know. America. And that and, was our goal. And actually, that's, that's not good for business for us because if they can get their own local comedians, then what are they going to fly us out for? But it's great to have to your own voice. Stand up comedy is all about having your own voice, your freedom of speech, your freedom to express whatever's on your mind. And that's what's needed in the Middle East. And it's happening. Let's go to Arizona for a call. Caller? Hello? Hello, your question? They're watching Arizona. TV. Arizona. Arizona. Uh. I don't, oh, we, I can hear Dean's in the back. He's, he's listening, listening to TV, yeah, and he's... Is it a delay? All right. Um, what can you do? But the, the, I, I find that during the Egyptian Revolution and during all these things, we have friends over there, um, and there's a comedian um, who was going through it and staying up late, and the, the revolution was going on, and they were already writing jokes about it and trying to think of how they can express it. The fact that that bubble burst and they felt like they could really, truly express things. Um, you know, Maysoon got in trouble in Egypt one time for saying something about the Egyptian Airlines. I mean, it, it was, uh, we can talk freely about Mubarak now, I mean, there was a lot of trouble there. You couldn't speak out about even their nationalized airlines. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, for that bubble to burst and for people to feel free to talk, especially in Egypt, such a big city, such a diverse culture there, that's nice to see. And, and, the, and the more, and comedy is just one little small piece of them being able to stand up, get on a soapbox, say whatever they want to say, and, and uh, that's a freedom that we kind of take for granted here because it's been around so long, but it's important for them. Yeah, and they inspired us. Our tour is called the Comedy Revolution Tour. It's the Arabs Gone Wild Comedy Revolution Tour inspired by the revolutions of the Middle East. I mean, we're doing our show Saturday in D.C. and then, you know, in Philadelphia in another week. And the whole thing, with, like, we're going to Arizona for the Muslims are coming October 6th, and Aaron's going to join us October 8th and 10th. But you get inspiration from the young people in the Middle East. That's you know? when you go to Utah. We're going to Utah, and Ira's yeah. coming with us. He's got yeah. family, a Mormon family up there, some Mormons yeah. on, on his mom's side, and we're going to do a show. It's, and again, it's free. It's, in, it's all 100% free. We want to meet people with the Muslims are coming to our Arabs going to we want to make money. It's a little different. Let me, let me go to California. California? Yes, uh, I'm from Central Europe, and I just wondered if the, uh, the people in the Arabic countries uh, have found the same as I have when I came to this country, which was... Uh, American humor seems to be largely based on uh, sexual innuendo or, or uh, you know, uh, kind of dirty jokes and, and mm -hmm. uh, wordage, etc., uh, which you don't find. There's uh, a lot so of that. Th there's a lot of that, and it, uh, I find it irritating oftentimes when that becomes the requirement, uh, it, almost because that's the only punchline you can get. 
Yeah. Mom used to tell me I was being cheap with words when I had to do that because she said, I'd say, but I was angry. And she'd say, well, then find an intelligent way to express your anger. That's not doing it for me. Mm. That's a good mm. point, though. It is the cheap laugh. It's the mm. easy laugh to do a joke about sex. Yeah. It really is. And it, it seduces you with the big laughs. You do a joke about sex, you get huge laughs. If you want to do a political joke, you want to do an intelligent joke, a social commentary, the laughs are there, but they're not the same. And, and you know, that it pulls you to the dark side of comedy. Yeah. Uh, it's easier. Uh, I it's, I just choose not to do that kind of material for who I am. It's up, to, you know, each comic, I don't judge them. They do whatever they can make their living, whatever they want to be. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that too. And then we have the benefit of being able to prepare what we want to say. And you're going to improvise a little bit, a little line here and there. But the, the, we have the benefit of sitting and thinking out our material and deciding how do you want to present yourself and how do you want to mm -hmm. be, you know, how do you want to represent yourself. And don't, don't just go out there on the fly and forget that, like, you see a lot of comics, you're like, didn't you think about this before you got up there, you know, yeah. didn't, you, didn't you prepare anything, but, <laughs> I mean, but Jim, don't you ever find humor in what you do um, in serious professional oh, situations? Oh my God. How funny is that? My, I mean, ever. My life is a joke most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, and thank you for what you do. I mean, it's, I think from 9-11 on till now, in this new challenge that you guys are taking on, it's an extraordinary contribution to the community and to the culture uh, that we all represent, and uh, and you do a real service. Thank you very yeah, you much for what you do. You do Thanks too. So all of us are coming yeah, from yeah. different angles. That's what I think. Except I don't get to laugh. When we come back, <laughs> political commentator and talk show host Bill Press will be here. We'll take more of your calls. Stay with us.